line. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Judge Lopez. Today is January 24th. I appreciate everyone's patience. Uh, it's, time is 1.20. I'm going to call the matter that was scheduled for 1 p.m., case 23-90085, Sorrento Therapeutics, Inc. here on a couple of motions. Why don't I take appearances in the courtroom, and then I will turn the folks online. Let's see if there's anyone online. Let's just see. Ah, there are, let's see, um, about 190 people online. So I'm going to keep the line muted for now. If parties wish to make an appearance, um, you may do so. I'd ask that you please do it electronically. Why don't we take appearances in the courtroom? Your Honor, Tim Culberson, party in interest. Good afternoon, Mr. Culberson. Nice to finally meet you. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Hector Duran with the U.S. Department of Justice for the U.S. Treasury. Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, Your Honor. Chris Harris of Latham & Watkins for the debtors, and with me is my colleague, Caroline Reckler. Okay. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Chris Bankler and Jen Graham from Jackson Walker. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Tom Kirkendall on behalf of Elizabeth Freeman. Good afternoon, Mr. Kirkendall. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Maria Mokshetka of North and Rose Fulbright on behalf of the committee. Okay. Good afternoon. Okay, uh, is there anyone else who wishes to make an appearance? Uh, anyone on the line who is wishes to make an appearance in connection with arguments to be made today? At, we're here on Mr. Culbison's motions. Just a second. Gives me a second to work through these. Ah, all right, I've got one. It's an 830 number. Hi, Your Honor, can you hear me? Yes, just fine. Hi, Richard Ramirez of Glen Abra, Bergman and Fuentes on behalf of the Equity Committee. Oh, good afternoon, sir. I'm going to keep your line unmuted. If you can just, uh, Mr. Ramirez, just monitor, kind of just keep your phone unmuted, but I'll keep your line unmuted. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Just give me a second. All righty. Um, we are here uh, on two Rule 60, uh, three, uh, a Rule 60B motion uh, with respect to Latham and Watkins, Jackson Walker and M3 Partner. Uh, by Mr. Carberson in the alternative, there was a motion uh, filed seeking to compel discovery. Uh, and then both were set for today. Well, I saw an agenda that got filed. And okay, uh, Mr. Carberson, let me turn things over to you, sir. And if you just get close to any mics, just to make sure we can all hear each other. Sure. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, for a housekeeping matter, before I get started, I brought my laptop with GoToMeeting in here now. Okay. Uh, I'll reference exhibits that are part of the exhibit list for this hearing. Uh -huh. um, as I as I talk about those, would you like me to publish them on my and sh share my screen with you, or how do you want to proceed? If, uh, if you can just refer to me, or you can mention it to me, whatever is easier for you, sir. Okay. All right. Thank you, Your Honor. Yes. All right, Chris Harris, I just wanted to clarify: should we suggest we get the evidence into the record then, or we're going to be arguing from it now, um, unless there's an objection to that process? Are you seeking to admit documents into evidence? Well, this is a hearing. It's not a bench trial. It's not a jury trial. So I don't, I don't, I wasn't intending on doing that. But I'll be glad to do that if, if we need to. Okay. Uh, what are your thoughts, folks? I mean, the, the debtors do have a limited amount of evidence we do want to admit for purposes of the hearing. Okay. Uh, Mr. Harris, I'm, I'm, I'm getting told that, that folks can't hear you. I apologize. No worries. Just so that I get the record, I said the debtors do have a limited amount of evidence we do want to admit. I don't, it's Mr. Culberson's motion, so I'll let him go. Yeah, I think Mr. Culberson should be able to proceed as he, as he sees fit, uh, and we'll, we'll see where things go. Yes, counsel. If I may, if I may Your Honor, uh, in the agenda we noted, as far as the motions that are going forward today, there was, uh, at least on our side, a lack of clarity as to which motion the court was going to take up and, and in which order. And so... Why was there a lack of clarity? We held a hearing on it last week. Like, the status conference last week, because Your Honor uh, stated at the at the status conference last year uh, last week that you were first going to decide the discovery issues and then decide whether or not then we'd be proceeding with the 60B. And so I just wanted to make sure that I understood, Your Honor. Certainly, we're here and ready to deal with the discovery issues. I I, I think the way I envision this, and Mr. Culberson is certainly going to be able to put on his presentation. Um, let me, let me hear Mr. Culberson's presentation. I, I think I need to hear from from his presentation first and kind of see where he's going. But I'm, I'm going to let him. I'm going to let him say what he wants, and I'm going to let him proceed, uh, and then I'll, I'll take everything up in in the ordinary course. Yes, Your Honor. Okay. 
Um, Mr. Carverson, there was one housekeeping matter that I know we talked oh, about yes. too at the. Yes. Yeah. Yes, Your Honor. I have a redacted version of my Schwab One account in my name with proof of ownership in Strindle Therapeutics. I would like to tender that to the court in camera only. Is that the housekeeping matter? Yeah. Are you, I'm okay with that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, I would note then for at least the for purposes of getting me comfortable today, um, I think Mr. Culberson, um, and, and you can take this back. Chairman has party and interest uh, and may be heard today. Um, as, as far as exhibits, Your Honor, um, I don't have a problem going through the exhibit list. I, I listed 25 or 23 different exhibits. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the exhibits one and two are court documents, notice of bankruptcy filings. So I would ask those be admitted as, as public record as part of the court's filing. Um, I would I would ask that all the exhibits be admitted. I think probably uh, Exhibit 5, which is the Wall Street Journal article, obviously there would be, I, I assume, a hearsay objection, but I'm not offering it for the truth of the matter asserted. I'm providing context to everything that even the declarations that have been filed in this case admit that they knew of the relationship. So I, um, all is, of the documents... Is it okay were, if we kind of go through them one by one? I just want to make okay. sure that, that we're, just that we're all clear. So Exhibit 1 is the notice of bankruptcy filing. That's the time-stamped one for 23 and 90085. Um, any objection to those, the admission of those documents? I, they're, they're public record. Yeah, no, Your Honor. Okay. Um, um, I'm just going in. I'm just going in. Oh, order. okay. Yes. Yeah. So one and two, um, I will admit. Uh, three is general order 2022 4, which is our general order. 20, I think 2019 7. Um, let me just take a quick look at those. Uh, I'm assuming there's just no objection to, to, to General Order 2020. This is just what's on the, what's on our what's on our public website. Right. No, no objection to three or four. Okay. Number five is a Wall Street Journal article dated October 27, 2023. Any objection to that document? I'm, I'm assuming not for the not for the truth of the matter asserted, but just public uh, like judicial notice or something. Yes, Your Honor. Any issue with judicial notice on that? It's for the fact that those statements were made publicly, which is a non-hearsay purpose. I, we don't have an objection to that. Okay, so we'll, we'll just admit them. Uh, we'll, think, we'll call it judicial notice, and not for the truth of the matter asserted that the statements in there are true. They, they say what they say. Yes, I think that's fair. Uh, document number six is document one two four four dash one. Uh, let me take a look. Is this on the public docket? Yes, Your Honor. And it's in under the case number listed. Don't know what this is. Oh, this is in a in case number. You know what case this is in? 220184. Okay. Counsel? Your Honor, this is a it, an email chain, so we would object on the basis of hearsay. And, you know, it, it, I'm not sure for what purpose Mr. Culberson would be offering it, but he doesn't have a witness to sponsor the email either. Mr. Culberson, what is your response to that, sir? I would argue that it's already in evidence in that case, and I'm not offering it for the truth of the matter asserted. But, and I really, what's, what's I'll, I'll withdraw six because Exhibit 22 proves my point as to Jackson Walker. Okay. Well, let's not worry about six then. Uh, seven is document number two is the joint admin, or the motion for joint admin in this case. I don't think there's any issues with that. Nine and ten, I'm assuming, are invoices from publicly filed documents. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. Are those from documents from this case? Yes, Your Honor. All right. Any issues with those? Yes, Your Honor. These appear to be legal invoices for which he doesn't have a, a witness to sponsor these. He, he hasn't authenticated and proved them up. And uh, are they publicly filed on the docket? That's what I'm just trying to figure out. If he's offering them for the fact that they've been offered, you know, that they've been publicly filed, then then obviously we don't have an objection to that, Your Honor. But my suspicion is he wants to get into the substance of the the time entries on the docket, and he doesn't have a witness to do that. Yeah, but he can certainly... Yeah, I I'm going to overrule that objection. No, I'm going to overrule that objection. There's a, there's a publicly filed document, and it says what it says. And unless Jackson Walker wants to tell me that something on a timestamp on their invoice is incorrect, I think you're, you're going to have to live with what you filed on the docket. No, that's fine, Your Honor. Okay. Uh, 18 is the order approving the, the in, that one's fine. 19 is, is that a publicly filed document? Yes, Your Honor. Can, okay. 20, is that a publicly filed document? Yes, it is. It's document number 1017. Is that in 1017 in this case? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. 21 is the Latham retention order. 22, what is 22? 
That is a document filed in cause number 220184. It's the preliminary, preliminary response of Jackson Walker with stated facts in the record in open court. Objection to 22. Was it filed in this case, Mr. Alderson? No. 2220-20184. Just so long as we're clear what it is. We, I mean, we stand behind what we filed. All right. That works for me. 23 is the article. Can we do the same kind of judicial that there Absolutely. is an article from Financial Times saying Absolutely, what it says? Well, I want, I want to be really clear for the record, Your Honor. He's not offering it for the truth of the matter asserted. Which one? The Financial Times? Yeah, no, I'm, I wouldn't accept it for the truth of the matter asserted. I don't know what it is. I would hope not. No, no, no. I got it. So, so, but but I think we're, we're going to treat Financial Times just like WSJ. It's I can take judicial notice that there was an article written on that day that says what it says, and that's necessarily for the truth of the matter asserted of the, document, of the statements therein. Yes, Your Honor. Okay. All righty. Sounds like we have agreement. I would just like to state for the record that this exhibit list has been on file, and I wish they would have approached me before today, wasting my time up here, because this could have been addressed and not waste your time, your honor's time. I'm Our here. system will yeah, end this second, conference in five minutes. Extend this call for one hour. Your conference has been extended for 60 minutes. I apologize. We've been having hearings since 8 o'clock in the morning, and so sometimes over a couple of hours, you just got to hit the reset button here. Um, I'm here Monday through Friday, uh, early in the morning and late. Don't worry about me. I'll give you here's, here's your time. So okay, you may proceed, counsel, as you wish. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, first of all, I want to I want to thank the court for the time that we spent last week, because um, ultimately all I've been trying to do as a shareholder of Sorrento and as an attorney is get to the truth of what's going on in this case. So when I filed my brief indicating the doubts that we have concerning the random selection of Judge Jones in this case, it was based on documents that were on its face, should have been reliable in the court record. Um, I understand through your careful de demonstration last week that uh, exhibits one and two, for example, uh, which are the notice of bankruptcy filing for both Sorrento uh, Therapeutics and Centilla Pharmaceuticals, that those documents now are not reliable for purposes of determining the rand who, which judge was randomly selected in this case. And I want it uh, pointed out for the record that these two documents are sealed by the United States Bankruptcy Court and their date and time stamped. And I believe that sometimes it takes cases to find problems that need to be rectified. And I would say that it is, as a, as a non-bankruptcy lawyer who's trying to learn the inner workings of this complex case system, it's very difficult for me uh, to test what's really gone on, and there, there are reasons to doubt the random selection of the judge because of what I've learned through court documents. For example, in exhibit number one, which is, is a file stamp document, mm -hmm. and I've been, in, I've been practicing for 23 years, and I was sending stuff to the courthouse be before we had electronic case filings, and they'd have to stamp a blue stamp on the, on yeah, the document. Yeah. Once that was with the clerk, it's you can't touch it. It's it's what it is. You can't change it. But apparently, what I'm what I'm hearing and learning is that exhibits one and two, which are the notice of bankruptcy case filing that are time stamped and date stamped, we can't rely on a very clear sentence at the bottom left hand corner of exhibit one that says the case was assigned case number twenty three dash nine zero zero eight four to Judge Christopher M. Lopez, all one sentence, and I also am a textualist, and I, I see that and I read that as a member of the public and as an attorney, and I, I understand now that there's a way that that name can be auto-populated, and that apparently is a separate field in this electronic document. But that is troubling to me because I look at that and I see that when the cause number was assigned, it was assigned to your honor. And I understand that that is, may not be the case. I still, today, and I, I listened to you and I understood what you were saying. But my issue was after, the, after that hearing, I went and spent an hour with a very nice young lady from the clerk's office. And she spent an hour with me. This is the clerk, one of the clerk's employees. And she could not tell me who was randomly assigned this case. She looked, she asked other people. What document can I look at to see who was randomly assigned this case? Now, I understand that there's pleadings that were filed at 1.12 in the morning after, after the petitions were filed that has the initials of Judge Jones. 
But those initials are placed there by the attorneys and their staff. That's not an auto, that's not a court document until it's file stamped. Mm -hmm. So that in and of itself doesn't prove who got the case randomly. And then I look at the transfer order. But what, 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 what's wrong with looking at the docket itself? Usually, yeah, and I can, I can pull you 20 cases. In other words, when you see the judge link that, that I showed you, which is not public, it's pulling it from the docket, you know, and if, and if a judge gets switched. So in other words, if I got the case, it would say Lopez, if Jones got, and if Jones switched it, which, again, I would have to be, right, that would have to be going to me and then me saying, okay, it would still then show involvement of David, involvement of Christopher Lopez terminated, involvement of David Jones becoming assigned. So in other words, I, I, I get what you're saying, and I have, I, I tell you what I've done too, just as, a, as an aside, I, I agree with you, it's confusing. And I went out and reached out to the, our clerk of the court and said, I get it, it's a national forum, but let's find who is in charge of kind of proposing changes to the national forum and, and you know, kind of maybe tweaking the sentence in a way because it, it, it's got to be all across the United States. And I don't know if other, I don't know the history of, of other, if anybody else has noticed it or, or what the process is, but I can certainly tell you, uh, at a minimum, I thought it made sense and to 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 go there, um, but but there's no nothing on the docket, right? Um, and so you, you're you're digging for something that Jones got the case. I I didn't get the case. I remember exactly where I was. I remember exactly what was going on. I woke up the next morning after watching the Super Bowl and watching the Chiefs play the Eagles and Rihanna perform. I got up the next morning. I checked it at four o'clock in the morning. I didn't get the case. I moved on. I got the case at eleven o'clock. Case called Tay Home. I, I didn't get the case. I'm, I'm telling you, I, I remember exactly where it was. And, and then the, 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 the footprint on the docket tells you, I, I didn't get the case. I, I, I'm just telling you, I didn't, I'm, I'm telling you, I didn't get the case. And, and the footprint shows it. There's, I don't know what else I can, I can show you different cases where you can see involvement of so-and-so terminated and involvement. In other words, the, the order that Jones signed didn't, if he would have signed an order that would have assigned cases to him, it would say, assign to Lopez, and then there's an order kind of directing the clerk to then change it, and it would say involvement of Lopez ended, involvement of uh, involvement of David Jones beginning. I can, it, Thank you, Your Honor. I appreciate that. I, and I don't want to sit here and question the court at all. No, no. I'm just it, trying it, to understand. I got it, man. And, yeah. and I, I, look, you, it, I think it was important to kind of walk through that and, and talk about it. And, and you, you highlighted something that, you know, okay, I think it was a great point. I, I really do. I'm, I don't fault you for that. That's confusing. Yeah. And, and, and also, and I, the, the actual joint, the joint administration order that again was filed the same day as this case. So a lot of stuff is happening in a very short time yeah. frame. So, so I was wondering, is there any way your honor would not be aware that the case was originally assigned to you because it was switched so quickly by Judge Jones in the joint administration order. That was the question that I had in my in no, my no. head. And so I don't want to get sidetracked by this one no, fact I, because I got it. Because I, I understand now that exhibits one and two aren't really reliable for what they say. Um, and I hope in the future that we can rely on no. a, a, a sealed document or a, 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 a document that's got the seal of the bankruptcy court date and time that it cannot change. That would be a, a great Function. Or, or if it changed, yeah, right. It's something that I agree. I think it's got to either be a change or have a sentence. This case was initially assigned to so and so, and now it's with so. So you can kind of follow the footprint when it's time stamped. Or you know, I got it. That makes. So I don't want to belabor that point, but I, I just wanted for the record to uh, for for folks to understand why there was some question and doubt there. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's, but there's much more, there's more disturbing factors that unfortunately have led us to where we are here today. The, the systemic problem, and I want to give a little context for the record, the systemic problem of improper form and judge shopping is not my, my own concern, and I'm not raising this on my own, because uh, it is well documented in many law review articles and authoritative publications that I cited in the court briefing, in my court briefing. In this case, so my case does not stand alone with this complaint. Um, forum and judge shopping in the Southern District and bankruptcy cases is a hot topic right now. In fact, my, my former uh, uh, law, law dean, uh, Nancy Rappaport, either I think she has fought, just recently published an article dealing with the problem and focusing on uh, the Southern District. 
as well as even this case. Uh, the inherent problems and temptations that accompany uh, trying to attract mega cases into the Southern District uh, present uh, a threat to the partiality and credibility of our court system. For example, Judge Jones appointed Ms. Reckler of Latham and Watkins based in Chicago, and he appointed his, we now know was his girl, live-in girlfriend, Ms. Freeman, to the complex case advisory panel in 2019. Ms. Reckler and Ms. Freeman served together on Judge, G Judge Jones' committee for over two and a half years. It, it, and that's exhibits it, three and four. It's not his committee. I just want to kind of clarify. It, well, it's his order then. He's the one who selected He, he was the chief judge at the time. Yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. I'm sorry. I, 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 should, I shouldn't say it's his committee, but he was the judge, the chief judge at the time, and he's the one who selected Ms. Reckler and Ms. Freeman together on the committee with some other folks uh, in 2019. We now know this was during the time. What that makes you think he's the one that selected them? Because it's in the general order is signed by Judge Jones. But just because it's signed by him, do, do you see how judges can get together though and have a conversation and kind of discuss, and then he's the one that officially signs it? No, I'm just, I'm, I'm just, I'm kind of, I, I want you to do your presentation, but, but it's not like someone is hand plucking and saying you, you know, you. It's, it, there's discussion. So if somebody, for example, now if we're going to get a new member on, on the complex committee, I won't sign the order. Judge Rodriguez, you know, may, may sign the, 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 the new complex. I'll have a say. For... <laughs> so is it, I want to be fair to Judge Jones. He certainly would have had a say in selecting Ms. For sure. For sure. And, and Ms. Jones. For sure. For sure. Uh, I mean, Ms. Freeman and Ms. Reckler uh, in 2019. And, it, it, and we know during that time now that Ms. Freeman was in a romantic relationship with Judge Jones. There was also, incidentally, a partner from Kirkland and Ellis, the largest law firm in the nation, also served on the committee at, uh, under Judge Jones' order. It is no coincidence that representatives from the two largest law firms that could feed cases into the Southern District were on this advisory panel. It is important to note that in context, how we get to where we are today with Jackson Walker working with Latham and Watkins, that initially it was Kirkland and Ellis who was working, working heavily with Jackson Walker and Elizabeth Freeman in the Southern District leading up to this scandal. And then after, then there, then there was a Financial Times article dated November 21st, 2023, which I cited as Exhibit 23, uh, that talks about that relationship between Kirkland and Ellis and Jackson Walker. Your Honor, I think he is now trying to use this document for the truth. No, I, I think he's making statements, and I'm, I'm certainly going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to allow him to make the statement. And the, and the involvement of Jackson Walker and Kirkland Ellis' public record, Judge, a simple statistic search shows that they had many cases in front of this court, in front of the Southern District, and that trend stopped in around 2021. And then the uptick in the statistics show, and this is public record, that then Latham and Watkins steps into that gap and starts working with Jackson Walker after and Le after Kirkland Ellis steps down. Mr. Coverstein, I just want to give you just an example. This was signed on July 6, 2023. It's the new complex committee, and who kind of came on and came off. And the person who signed it uh, is Eduardo Rodriguez, our new chief judge, who became chief judge. And and so, you know, I'm, it, obviously the, the complex cases go to Judge Isker and I, but he signed the order. The chief judge just signs the general orders. Just kind of, I just I wanted to make to make, make the point. I, I, it, it was just important that you. That okay. Uh, okay. Thank you, I'm sorry. Please continue. This leads us to how did a biotech company specializing in the development of life-saving cancer drugs non-opioid pain relief and possessing a massive GMAB library of monoclonal antibodies based in San Diego, California and incorporated in Delaware ends up in the Southern District of Texas here in Houston. The venue party is Scintilla Pharmaceuticals. I have spoken with the UPS store owner where this address, this PO box 513 is located. I have a subpoena out for records that I will soon have in possession concerning this PO box. This is important context, Your Honor, because this explains why we're here, why we're in Houston. A member of Jackson Walker set that P.O. box up within a day or two of filing this petition in clear violation of the venue statute that says principal place of business is to establish within 180 days of filing. This was intentionally done, and then they have no offices here in the Woodlands. It's a peel. It's a it's a uh, UPS store, and then they apparently ignore the clear language in the U.S. Supreme Court in Hertz v. Friend that deals with the definition of principal place of business, 
which says that you're supposed to use the nerve test. And a P.O. box is, can never be used as a principal place of business. Jackson Walker and Latham Watkins had to have known that they were violating the, the, the basic venue rules when they filed this petition back in February. The P.O. box hadn't been set up for maybe a day or two, and now I understand that after speaking with the UPS owner that it is now in default and has not. It was a six-month payment of $120, and nothing has been done since then, and now it is locked and closed. That cannot possibly be what our venue statute anticipated and what the U.S. Supreme Court anticipated when establishing a principal place of business. So we have a problem here that is systemic and it's also specific to this case. And with that, in, with that please do not interrupt my argument. Oh, sit down. People are allowed to make openings and statements. Go ahead. Do Thank you, Your Honor. With that in mind, there is great irony in the name of the subsidiary company chosen by the debtor's lawyers called Centilla Pharmaceuticals because there is not a scintilla of business being conducted in Texas. No employees, no accounts, no business ever transacted in this district, no offices, no registered agent, no nerve center. This P.O. box violated 28 U.S.C. 1480, and they knew it when they, when they filed this case back in February. Because I can't imagine lawyers in these big firms don't understand the rules that are to be followed in this district. So now let's get into why. Why was this done? Why did we come into the Southern District? And I understand the judge, Your Honor, has said in the past there was a 50-50 chance this could have been, you, you could have been the unintended uh, target. But I would suggest a 50-50 chance. Oh, call me a target. <laughs> well, I think that was your, I'm sorry. That was, Just kidding. I'm, no, no, go ahead. Go um, ahead. But I, I, I think those are pretty good odds to get someone who they know uh, that I believe Jackson Walker for sure knew was had a girlfriend who used to work for them who was going to be involved in this case, and I'll explain that. Setting aside the false venue facts, though, setting aside the lack of official documentation of the assignment of judges in this case, let's look at what happened on filing day. On one, at, by 1.12 a.m. on February 13th, the Latham and Watkins and Jackson Walker lawyers were aware that Judge Jones would be their judge, regardless of how. Mm -hmm. They knew, there's no question, Exhibit 7 and Exhibit 8 show that when they filed their emergency uh, motion for joint administration, and it was and, and the filing proof of filing says at 1.12 a.m., they put the initials of Judge Jones on their document. So knowing Judge Jones is now the judge on this case, the first day, who is the, one of the first calls Ms. Caroline Reckler of Latham & Watkins makes to discuss, quote, litigation strategy, and that's in Exhibit 9? Who is the person, who is one of the first persons she talks to once they know it's Judge Jones? That's Elizabeth Freeman. And on its face, this has the appearance of impropriety at best. Why consult with her after the lawyers find out Judge Jones is on this case? So far, we've heard two explanations. One, they used her as a conflicts counsel. Yet Jackson Walker was selected by Latham as their local counsel and conflicts counsel. That's part of their retention agreement. That's the scope of their representation. There was no need to consult Ms. Freeman, who was out on her own in her own practice by this time. Second, another excuse that they've, they've used for Ms. Freeman appearing in the records Ms. Freeman was consulted because of her extensive knowledge of the local procedures in the Southern District. And while I do not doubt Ms. Freeman's intimate knowledge of the local procedures and her connections with this court, not with this court, but with the, with, with the court in general, after all, she did clerk for Judge Jones before she went to work for Jackson Walker. However, it is highly doubtful that Ms. Reckler, who served on the Complex Case Advisory Committee in the Southern District for several years, would need help figuring out local procedures in this court. Not to mention the fact that Latham Watkins has an office within walking distance of this courthouse. There was no reason for Ms. Freeman to be consulted. And frankly, Your Honor, that's just a reasonable suspicion that would certainly require me to get discovery, but there's more to this than that. Ms. Freeman's counsel in this case has represented to this court that she was only involved in pre-petition work in this case. But this clearly is not the truth. It was only after the petition was filed 
and Judge Jones gets, gets the case that we see these consultations begin to appear. The call with Ms. Reckler regarding litigation strategy, which is Exhibit 9, is not, only, is not the only time on the filing day that Ms. Freeman spoke with the Latham and Watkins lawyers. Another consultation with Ms. Freeman occurred regarding mediation, unquote, on February 13th, 2023. That's also in Exhibit 9. On its face, this consultation also is the appearance of impropriety. Why is Ms. Freeman, a non-retained, non-approved solo practitioner, discussing the mediation details involving the Nancell litigation with Latham and Watkins? And one of the suspicions that I have, and I think it's a fair question, is were they using her as a back channel to talk to Judge Jones about the mediation and what was going to be done and how it was going to be done? On February 15th, two days later, after the petition, this is post-petition consultations, Ms. Ionella of M3 Partners, and this is in Exhibit 10, has uh, a discussion with Latham and Lawyers and Elizabeth Freeman regarding, quote, first day hearings, unquote. Again, there is no conceivable reason for Ms. Freeman as a non-retained, non-approved solo practitioner should be discussing the first day hearings the day before the hearing occurs because that's the timing. They discuss with her first day hearings and then the hearing happens the next day. I, I don't understand that part. Well, if they're discussing with her about first day hearings, they're obviously preparing for those first day hearings that appear before Judge Jones. Mm -hmm. So that would be an opportunity to communicate back channel to Judge Jones about what they're going to do the following day. I'm, what I'm saying is there is a serious question here, Judge. But, but when you look at the pleadings, and I, I get the point, what what relief was requested in those pleadings that you find to be extraordinary? Like 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 what's in there that you're like I backdoor channeled and got X or again got Y? You know because it, they look. In other words, what I'm saying is they look really really like the stuff I see every day that gets filed in this case. In terms of the the, the well, no, I take that back. It, this case was a little different in the sense that. The Nant, you know, they, they filed, and then they only kind of asked for joint admin, and they kind of filed some other motions and kind of come back. Usually you get, like, all these pleadings filed at, like, midnight, 1 in the morning, and people come in, like, 2 in the afternoon, and they ask for all that stuff. Like, this one kind of got put out a little bit, and then parties came in and asked for a mediation, and that's where I think some of the equity folks asked for the trustee to get appointed, and, and then the equity committee got appointed shortly thereafter. Um, what... what I just want to make sure. I, I got that you think that there were some communications, but is there something in the – I'm really asking, is there something in the docs that you're saying, aha, uh -huh, that's that's something there? Well, I think there is as I go through the, the later dates. Okay. Where I am where I am handcuffed, Your Honor, is this, this – there's a lot of inside trading going on in terms of the lawyers know everybody, and I shouldn't use this phrase, inside trading. That's, well, loaded, I, I, that's loaded. What I I'm trying to say is I'm an outsider looking in. Shareholders are outside looking in. Yep. And these lawyers know each other. They work together. It's, it's bankruptcy community, as I understand, is a very tight-knit community. I worked in the medical malpractice community. I know all the defense lawyers. I know all the plaintiff's lawyers, the judges that we get in front of. We, you know, There's nothing wrong with that in and of itself. But because the 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 ha-ha the moment, I think we see that with Jackson Walker for sure when they file their retention, uh, they file their application for retention, and I'll go through that in a second. Mm -hmm. But as far as looking at every single document entry and saying, well, what about these these hearings, uh, the, the, the first day hearings? I would say they're probably routine, but here's the thing. I think what we're seeing is, and this is something, and I gotta be very careful, we are still investigating mm -hmm. how all of this ended up where we're talking liquidation right now. There's a lot of layers of this onion to unpeel, and, and believe me, I'm gonna get to the bottom of it. But for right now, where we are today, all I would say to the judge is this, Rule 327 disclosure rules and 2014 disclosure rules do not require me to prove harm. They don't require me to, to say there's an aha moment where they got something they shouldn't have got or they got something that they wouldn't have normally have gotten in relief because it's the appearance of impropriety. If you're using conflicts of interest, if you're using insiders such as Ms. Freeman to facilitate what you're trying to accomplish in a more grander picture with regard to the debtor, and whether it's for the debtor or against the debtor, the conflict of interest has to be disclosed under the rules, and I don't have to prove damages. I don't have to prove that I was damaged. 
It's the fact that that's not how we should conduct business in the courthouse. Your point is, under 327 and 2014, it is their burden to disclose, and the lack, all you have to establish is the lack thereof of a disclosure that was supposed to be required. Yes, Your Honor. Got it. And so on March 11th, we move on to March 11th, Mr. France and Mr. Medgi, the CRO of M3 Partners, is on two separate calls with multiple lawyers from Latham and Watkins, and here again Ms. Freeman is on these calls both times that day. And the motion is filed under seal, and a declaration, I assume because it's under seal, I'll make the assumption that was Mr. Medgi's declaration since they were talking with M3 Partners, but I don't know that for sure. Which declaration was filed under seal? There was docket numbers 205 through 207 that were filed under seal, and then the same day Judge Jones signed an order that's also under seal that's docket number 209. So on March 11th, and this is the same, this all happens in one day. So there's a call about edits to a motion and edits to a declaration with Mr. Medgi on the phone with lawyers from Latham and Watkins, and they're discussing edits, and it's, quote, discuss and provide edits to the declaration and motion to be filed. There are three different versions of that motion. If you look at the docket, 205, 206, and 207, we find, and I can't tell the name of the motion, but I can see that they're titled exactly the same, and it's a pretty logical conclusion that there were edits made, the first one that was filed, then a second one's filed, and then a third one. There's two times that they refiled it. Now, they're, oh, got it. I know. So. No, no, no. I know what this is, and I'm going to ask debtors. There's a way that you can amend your complaint to add additional facts that would support your claim, and you can amend it to add additional facts that would support your claim. So there's a way that you can, you know, and you can call it confidentiality or something, and whatever happened happened at the time. I think there's a way to show what that is. I know, I understand why it was done at the time. I'm looking at it now. Oh, I know what that is. Yep, I remember the day. We have no objection to Mr. Culberson seeing that now under the protective order. Yeah, I think there's like a protective. You'll, I'm not saying, I'm just looking at the title. I just, I now know what happened on that day and why this was filed that way. Okay. And so all I will say was I'll reserve that to see what was actually filed. Yeah, 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 yeah. But here's my thought. I don't know if by looking at that I can tell that Ms. Freeman was not involved in that. Oh, no, no. I think it will be really clear what, I think it will be really, you'll know, and if you look, you'll see it on the protective order and just sync up the day, kind of, you know, you'll look the day it was filed, and then it will make sense as to what was going on. Okay. Just for the record, I want to make sure I express my concern. You're preserving all your rights. Yeah, yeah. No, and I appreciate that. I actually appreciate the openness because, frankly, I know there are reasons why things can't be discussed so that shareholders can have an understanding of what's going on in a case. But when things are kept where everything is kept secret in a case, it is really difficult. I got it. And it starts to look a little, it looks, you know what I'm saying. So I just, so I want to finish the thought in that when you look at that sequence of events and you see two times that Ms. Freeman is definitely involved in discussions about edits, and then Judge Jones signs the order the same day, how it could appear that Ms. Freeman was involved in helping them get it to Judge Jones' satisfaction before he signs the order. So I'll leave that at that. You will, I'm not saying you'll agree or disagree, but you'll know it will make, it'll make sense. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. We move to March 13, 2023, and another critical juncture and, frankly, a bizarre case. Another lawyer with Latham and Watkins discusses, quote, UCC reconstitution, unquote, with Ms. Freeman and the Latham team. That's Exhibit 12. Again, Judge, remember, we've been told she was just consulted for procedures. She's a conflicts counsel, even though she hasn't been retained and we didn't pay her anything. She's just doing this for friends. But there's having serious, I mean, she's on the call about very substantive issues, especially the UCC reconstitution. And I do recall, after reading some of the record, that Nance Sell was the party that was in the UCC that shouldn't have been on there. And I don't know how in the world they ever were selected on the UCC committee when we know everyone knew that 
they were part of litigation directly against ongoing litigation with the debtor, and they were, and the mediation was largely based on that litigation. And so the question is, why are you consulting with Liz Freeman about that UCC reconstitution? And then once that's done, the same day as this call, an emergency motion to reconstitute the official committee of unsecured creditors is filed in docket number 219. So again, you can see why we would be suspicious about the timing of the, the communications that shouldn't have happened with Ms. Freeman to begin with and the actual action that's taken with regard to filing it. In other words, is this a back channel to Judge Jones to say, hey, here's what we've got, here's what we want to accomplish, and okay, then, so that Judge Jones is, is going to walk the line with whatever they want to do. And why would Ms. Freeman be on the call? I mean, that's, that's a question that I think we have at minimum a right to discover, although I'll get to a point in a minute where I don't, I just feel like the rules have been violated and the evidence will show that in a second. This is not the end of Ms. Freeman's involvement. And I, and I appreciate the court's indulgence on this, but there are several mentions in the records that need to be addressed. On March 17th, 2023, there is correspondence between Latham and Watkins attorney, Chris Craig, and Elizabeth Freeman, again, regarding, quote, Nant-related litigation issues, unquote. That's Exhibit 13. This correspondence also had Mr. Schenderman of the UCC Committee, Caroline Reckler, and Patty Tomasco, who represented the Nant cell party involved in the Sorrento litigation and also the mediation. And, it's, and then the next day, Ms. Tomasco files a response to the, to the reconstitution. So it, it's really hard for me to understand why Ms. Freeman is on a call to the debtors folks about reconstitution, then she's on a call that involves the opposite party, the, the, the net litigation attorney, Ms. Tomasco, and then all of a sudden we get the response the next day going to the court as if, again, Ms. Freeman is there to keep the judge abreast of what's going on in the background. The appearance of impropriety even continues on April 4th when Ms. Peguero of Jackson Walker coordinated with Ms. Freeman, quote, regarding entry of order and update LW team, unquote. That's Exhibit 14. The very next day, Ms. Peguero files a proposed order for Judge Jones to consider, docket number 367. And it doesn't matter the subject matter, Your Honor. The, the point I'm making here is, why are you talking to Ms. Freeman, who's not in this case officially, about an entry of an order, and then you're going to update the Latham Watkin team and this, is, again, is Jackson Walker's lawyer, so everybody's involved in this. And then they file a proposed order with Judge Jones. That's not a coincidence. We see it over and over again. There is no reason for Ms. Freeman to be involved in any entry of an order. But yet, here she is, it, and now we know she's doing favors for quote-unquote friends. That was discussed in the December 18th hearing. And yet she's a non-retained, still non-approved solo practitioner, working now, as it appears, in the shadows of this case, not on the record, not pursuant to disclosures. She's working in the shadows. Again, on April 12th, Ms. Mr. Craig of Latham corresponds with Ms. Freeman regarding, quote, mediation logistics and discovery, Exhibit 15. The day before, the debtors had filed an emergency motion requesting, guess what, Rule 2004 discovery. So again, you file something, you go to Ms. Freeman, let her know, have ex parte communications to Judge Jones. That's what this looks like because there's no reason for her to be involved, not in mediation logistics and certainly not in discovery. April 12th, again, the same day, Ms. Peguero of Jackson Walker spends half an hour discussing mediation with Ms. Freeman. We have both Latham and Jackson Walker on two different calls the same day discussing mediation with Ms. Freeman, who is, again, I won't keep belaboring the point, but she's not in this case. She's non-retained but she certainly is working in this case. She doesn't have any business being on these calls, Your Honor. Then we get to the disastrous sale of one of Sorrento's most valuable assets, its majority interest in Silex. And this is another layer of the onion that we will save for another day to unpeel. But Ms. Freeman certainly has no possible reason to be involved in the Silex stock sale process. Yet on April 18th, 2023, Ms. Reckler of Latham & Watkins consults with Ms. Freeman regarding, quote, the sales process, unquote. That's Exhibit 16. The same day as this discussion with Ms. Freeman, the Silex, scale is, the Silex sale motion is revised, 
and then presented to Judge Jones a few days later. That is alarming to me, Your Honor. Let me ask you a question. I understand the points. There are a lot of orders that get entered in this case. and There are a lot of orders sometimes that get entered like within short periods of time. How do I balance that with the orders that you're describing? So, for example, you know, the Equity Committee asked for Rule 2004 exams, and those things get entered within like 24 hours, right? You know, um, the Official Committee of Unsecured Creditors filed an emergency uh, motion to extend the application of the automatic stay to continue the restricted trading period, and that got a- approved like the the next day. How do I kind of balance the kind of what's what's going on there and with what what, with what we're kind of seeing here? I think are, are we finished, Your Honor? I yeah, yeah, no, no. I'm sorry. I, I, yeah, I think that. It's not necessarily the, the temporal arrangement between a request for something and the order being signed. Signed. That's not the comparison I'm making because I know that in a bank, I'm not a bankruptcy lawyer, but I know that there are routine things that are done all the time. Now, this 2004 discovery is not necessarily routine, but I don't want to get it get off on a tangent. But I, what I'm what I'm raising to the court is interactions with Miss Freeman, and then the close proximity to court action or things that are submitted to the judge. And that's my concern, not necessarily. Got it, got it. Um, and now um, we talk about the, the sale process. Now we move to April 26, 2023. Ms. Piguero of Jackson Walker discusses, and this one's very critical as to Jackson Walker. Ms. Piguero of Jackson Walker discusses, quote, retention matters, unquote, with Ms. Freeman for an, she's, I, I, won't, I, won't, I want to be fair to, to, to the record. I put for an hour, but she bills for an hour, but I think she says analyze the retention and then discuss it with Ms. Freeman. I don't know if they spent an hour on the phone, but I do know she billed for an hour, and part of that was discussing with Ms. Freeman about retention matters, unquote. The next day, and that's Exhibit 17, the next day the Judge Jones signs an order authorizing the retention and employment of Jackson Walker as co-counsel and conflicts counsel for the debtors. That's docket number 541. The next day after Ms. Freeman is on the phone with Jackson Walker about retention matters, they file their application. This is another glaring example of Ms. Freeman being consulted about the very issue being decided by Judge Jones. Keep in mind, by Jackson Walker's own admission in court documents, Exhibit 22, and I'll go through that in a little more detail when I get to Jackson Walker, they knew by now that Ms. Freeman is a live-in romantic relationship with Judge Jones. Jackson Walker certainly knew that by their own admission in 2022. We are in 2023 now. Nevertheless, as a bold disregard for the integrity of this judicial process, in that very signed order attached is Jackson Walker's retention letter in this case, and that is, that is exhibit number 18. And I want to be very careful because attached to the order that Judge Jones signs where he approves Jackson Walker as counsel, the retention letter that's written by Matthew Cavanaugh, the partner for Jackson Walker, to Miss Elizabeth Zarapak on February 12th. This is the day before they filed the petition. Which, which, which exhibit are you looking at? Uh, exhibit 18, and it's document uh, exhibit 18 to my exhibit list. It's also document 541 in this case. Ah, perfect. Thank you. I, I'm just I'm, when I'm looking here, I'm looking at the docs online with you. Okay. okay. Thank you. Um, and then if you go down to page. If you're looking at the actual court document, it's page six of eight, Mm -hmm. uh, where it says conflicts cancel and special counsel. The last sentence buried in this letter says, at this time, at this time, February 12th, 2023, we are strongly recommending the engagement of the law office of Liz Freeman as conflicts counsel. Jackson Walker is strongly recommending Liz Freeman be engaged in this case when they knew by their own admission in 2022 that she was involved in a relationship with Judge Jones, and that is absolutely unacceptable. And this this is clearly, uh, this this is the counsel, this is the local counsel, Jackson Walker, and I understand, Your Honor, you mentioned the other day they're in a different bucket, but I would say they're all in the same bucket, and here's why. Latham Watkins, you can't tell me this kind of sophisticated firm doesn't know how to vet their local counsel. Now, I can't prove today that they told Kirkland Ellis, but there's an article that says Jackson Walker informed Kirkland Ellis about the, the issue with Ms. Freeman, and, and Kirkland Ellis backed away. Jackson Walker, you could tell me they didn't know? This is a tight-knit community of bankruptcy professionals, and this wasn't, by 2023, no one in Latham Watkins knew about this relationship. There were two other times 
that we know of up through May 5th, 2023, where Latham and Jackson Walker consulted with Ms. Freeman relating to the retention of consultants. That's Exhibits 19 and Exhibit 20. Why would Ms. Freeman be involved with retention of consultants? One of the questions that came to my mind is, do they are they passing names through Ms. Freeman to Judge Jones to know which which consultants they're going to recommend or use? I don't know. But again, that's where discovery can get to the bottom of it. Um, now, the innocence defense. Latham and Watkins and Jackson Walker argue that there is nothing to see here. They didn't try to hide their, these entries in the billing records. Therefore, Ms. Freeman's involvement has to be innocent. But that's not the whole picture, Your Honor, nor is it the correct analysis. First, if Ms. Freeman's involvement was innocent, why didn't Latham and Watkins and Mr. Meggie amend their disclosures under Rules 327 and Rule 2014 the moment they first learned allegedly on October the 6th that, this, that there was a relationship between Judge Jones and, and Ms. Freeman? And what provision of 2014 do you think would have need to be amended for, let's just say, an M3 disclosure? Like Jackson Walker, you got me. The Latham and Watkins, when they saw, and I was going to get to that a little bit in a minute, but I'll... I'm sorry. I'll, I'm no, 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 that's fine. I can address it now. Okay, October 6th, even according to their own declarations of Ms. Ms. Uh, Reckler and Mr. Meggie, they knew on October 6th that Ms. Freeman and Judge Jones were in an improper relationship. They knew that that was public, that was in the public venue at that point. 30 days go by from October 6th to November 7th where they didn't disclose. And what I would say under 2014 they should disclose is that, oh, we've been working, Ms. Freeman has consulted on this case. That she has been a part of substantive conversations, as I've shown you in the billing records. We need to disclose that, oh, my goodness, it's innocent. She didn't do anything wrong. We didn't do anything wrong. But in the overabundance of caution, because it's not about disclosing improper relationships. It's about disclosing anything that could be a hint of impropriety. And they knew on October the 6th that Ms. Freeman was involved in this case. There's no way Ms. Reckler didn't know. That was one of the first calls she made when they filed the lawsuit was to call Ms. Freeman. So my point is the rule 2014 and, and 327 stand for the proposition that they should have amended their disclosures. They should have provided that information for, for us to consume as parties and in interests. Then we determine, is there a problem here? But they did not disclose, and still to this day, they haven't disclosed. That's the audacity of these big law firms. They, they don't feel like they're, they feel like they're above the law, Your Honor, and I truly believe that. And the fact that it took 30 days, and the only reason that Ms. Reckler admitted in an email correspondence with the Equity Committee, and that's part of, and I can certainly uh, steer the court to that a little bit further along, if you bear with me one second. Mm -hmm. That would be Exhibit C to the docket number 1532. That was Mr. Glenn's motion uh, from the Equity Committee that was filed. Exhibit C was email correspondence between himself and Ms. Reckler. And the initial email was private. He didn't copy anyone. He basically said, you know, tell me this didn't happen. Tell me Ms. Freeman isn't involved. Because at this point, everyone knows about this relationship. The judge is stepping down. What's going on? This shocked everybody. And to say that Latham didn't know that in their own that they were interacting with Ms. Freeman in this case is it is not believable. And so at that point, they have a duty to disclose her involvement in this case so that we can all analyze it. But here's here's the here's what I believe is going on. Remember, between October and November, what are they consumed with? The lawyers are consumed with marketing and pushing a liquidation plan and telling everyone the sky is falling. And that's what they were consumed with between October and until the time we get to when Your Honor gets on the bench. And of course, Your Honor's calling out, well, tell me, give me cause for why we can't go forward with the liquidation plan. And no one speaks up at the time. And I was sitting there wanting to scream from high heavens, there is a reason for cause because we have to examine what's going on here before we move anywhere. We got to see what the impropriety of all of this. And so, Judge, I, I, I don't want to get off on a tangent, but I think that 30-day period, because the only way we know, only time Latham admitted that she was involved was only after they got caught. Only after someone with the Equity Committee spent hours and hours searching all those hundreds of lines of bills to find a mention of her in the records, and there's several that I've pointed out. And so... How, how do I deal with the fact that it was always there? Like, in other words, it, it, they didn't amend the, the fees applications to then 
In other words, it's been out there for months, and I'm, presumably the equity committee is doing their job in reviewing the bills as well and, and, and their own bills. So in other words, how, how, do I, how do I deal with – here's the question. How do I deal with the fact that it was already there? No one kind of amended this out there. It's not like somebody had to go do digging. They could have just pulled up the applications and their interim compensation procedures, which means that they've got to be – Kind of email, kind of emailed and provided to the other parties for them to review and object. So somebody was sending them this stuff, right? So the creditors committee would be reviewing it, the equity committee would be reviewing it, and then it gets publicly filed on the docket. I, I, I tell you what I wrestle with too. What do I do if like if someone from the equity? I'm not saying they did. What if like a member of the creditors committee spoke to them? What if a member of the equity committee spoke to Liz Freeman because she was a well-known attorney in in the district? And kind of where, where do you draw the line? You know, between, you know, she was an incredibly well-known lawyer and everybody knew that she had, you know, she kind of knew, you know, the, the complex world. And so maybe an equity committee member pulls it to the side and says, hey, how are we going to try this? I, I, I guess she shows up a lot here and you're making a good point there. I'm just wondering kind of where do you, you know, since that lawyers know each other, you, you kind of said in your bar, everybody knows each other. So, you know, is is the line kind of take discovery of every person who could have spoken to Liz Freeman who didn't know about it or or just trying to find the kind of the, the line. The Jackson Walker, again, I, I think they're in a different bucket because I think you're saying under 327, your own retention application says, attaches this, and, and they've got this language in here saying, we strongly recommend Ms. Freeman, and what's up with that? And you you, know, you all are talking to her, but you're saying she doesn't work there. I, I you know, I, I get your point there. Just wondering kind of where you draw the line or where should I consider drawing the line or, or is there not a line when, when something like this happens? I guess it's maybe the better way of thinking about it. And I'm trying to follow you as far as your first part of that question, which was yeah, what, you were ahead. asking about. Um, oh, like, what, what, what do you do if, like, in other words, it, it was, was already there? It's it's already there. A new judge gets appointed, kind of during that 30 day window, and you're already filing your fees. And the rules don't say that you actually have to disclose. Hey, I know there's an allegation of Liz Freeman there. You, you have to. You have to. It's it's parties and interest, but party and interest is the people who have a direct economic stake in the case that you. you you wouldn't disclose, hey, I know 2019, 2014, excuse me, is, is trying to get you to disclose what are your connections with the debtor, the United States trustee, parties and interests, and, and, and under like 1109 that usually is defined as people who have a direct economic stake in the litigation. So, hey, I have a connection with the lawyer so, you know, or a creditor that can't be on both sides of the deal, represent someone to be a fiduciary. It's questionable to me, and I'm being honest with you, and, and uh, I'm sure people are looking at, and at least there's been discussions of tweaking the rules in, in one way, but as it currently sits, a, a non, a professional, I, I think your question with Jackson Walker is maybe you should have done it in the first place, and certainly there were stages in which there are articles in the newspaper that say you should have disclosed certain things. I think with what, what do you do if you're like M3? I think that, Your Honor, if I understand your question, because I'm, I'm trying to I'm No, no, trying I, to I asked you like 30 questions in one question. So that's, I okay, that's okay. <laughs> I, I, think, I think that um, the fact that the, the documentation of Ms. Freeman's involvement is already there, that was one of the arguments that I've heard from, I believe, Ms. Reckler and some other hearings or briefing that, oh, well, we obviously didn't see any impropriety in what we were doing because she's in the billing records. We weren't trying to hide it. But at the time that those billing records are being created, Number one, there, we don't know about the impropriety. No one thinks that's going to come to the surface. At least the public doesn't know. There's no reason. It isn't until February, November the 7th, number one, that they even disclose. I think that, let me back up. When this becomes public, I think that the, the, the courts, the, the cases that I've looked at, the disclosure rules require even the appearance of impropriety. Even, even if there's a chance there could be some problem with the association of an entity or a person involved in a case that could cause some type of impropriety or some type of miscarriage of justice. We're trying to obviously have a fair and open uh, uh, process here in the bankruptcy court. And so if you have a lawyer who you've consulted with on very substantive issues, as I've shown in, in, in the records, and that lawyer is then outed in public as having having a relationship, a current live-in relationship with Judge Jones during the pendency of this case, that to me shouts for disclosure if you truly believe it's innocent. Because then we just, we say, look, we're going to be totally forthcoming here to everyone. Ms. Freeman is in the records. Here's all she did. We didn't know. And let, you know, but here we want to disclose it under rules 214 and 340, 327 and the overabundance of caution. That wasn't done. And it wasn't until November 7th that we even have an admission 
that she's in the records. And this is – Well, that's not – but that's not true, right? Because there was an – I would argue, or I'd tell you, I get the point that you're making, but we can't overlook the fact that this was something publicly on the docket that anyone could have seen months ago. So it's not – the admission is when you put it in – when you put it on the docket. I agree, Your Honor. But at the time that they filed them on the docket, we didn't know about the relationship with Judge Jones. So there's – we wouldn't know – In other words, yeah, but the admission – but what you're saying is you should file something saying, hey, by the way, six months ago there are these time records that say what they say. Correct. Because once they know Ms. Freeman is involved in a relationship with the judge that they're before in this case, they need to let us know that they were consulting with her because there could have been biases and prejudice. It's already on the docket is what I'm saying. In other words, the homework was easy to find because people could easily look at it. I mean, the equity committee didn't have to look really hard. Actually, we did. Actually – But I'm saying it wasn't hard to find. You can just pull up time records and do a control F. It's not – it wasn't incredibly difficult to figure out, well, what's going on. In other words, no one had to ask for discovery. It was already publicly filed on the docket. It was already on the docket, I agree. But it's buried in lines and lines of billing records, and there was no reason to go search for her name until it came out in public. That's the point. There was no reason for us to – there was no red flags when the billings were filed, the bills were filed, at least not as to Ms. Freeman's involvement, because there's no reason to question it. But on October the 6th, there's every reason to question it, and there's every reason for them to disclose her. But they did. No, they didn't. They did not disclose to the court under Rules 2. All they did was file their billing and hope that they would – The rule doesn't contemplate what we're talking about now. This is like unprecedented – I don't want to say – I don't know the history. But this is unprecedented stuff. The rule doesn't contemplate what you're talking about now. There are actually discussions to say maybe we ought to tweak this and tweak that now to kind of make sure we capture that in the rule. But as it sits right now, the rule in itself does not contemplate what you're describing for professionals like Latham and M3. Jackson Walker, you know, look, obviously, if they knew something, I think the rules would require them to disclose. And they're saying they have their defenses, and I don't want to get into the merits of that. Today's not the day to kind of take up the merits, if you will, on some of this stuff. I know that they've publicly denied it. I don't – I'm just telling you I haven't gone into the merits of what it is. But I think they're in a – I just see them in a different bucket than someone – when the rule doesn't say you've got to do it, right? The rule says any order approving the employment of attorneys, accountants, or auction employees shall be made only on an application. The application shall be filed. Yep. The application shall state the state's necessity for the employment, the names of the reasons for the selection, the professional services to be rendered, any proposed arrangement for compensation, and to the best of the applicant's knowledge, all of the person's connections with the debtor, creditors, and any other parties in interest, their respective attorneys and accountants, the U.S. trustee, or anybody employed by the Office of the United States trustee. And I would argue that last – Our system will end this conference in five minutes to extend this call. Tell me, we're both textualists. It doesn't contemplate it. Maybe it should. It actually says anyone employed, and we can argue – Anyone employed with who? In the case. But your connections with someone employed by the case, right? In other words, they did. They did not disclose Elizabeth Freeman's relationship with Judge Jones. They don't have to do that. In other words, what's going on in 11 – what's going on in October? There are allegations. There's news articles going on, right? Fifth Circuit issues a very serious document. What are they – what's the disclosure that – That Ms. Freeman was working in this case. It's publicly on the docket. You're not going to get me there. It's publicly on the docket. And I would note that the fees that are going to be requested on some of these are coming before me. And everybody's going to have an opportunity to come back and ask for them, right? We haven't even approved final fees in this case, right? And everybody knows final fees are approved, are subject. Everything's on the table when it comes to a final fee. You can get interim fees. You can get final fees. And final fees have not been approved in this case. And everybody's going to have their day in court and say, you know what? It's what we're doing. So, in other words, we're having the – that day hadn't come yet. And everybody knows the United States trustee holds all of – you know, sometimes it comes out early. Sometimes it comes out late. But interim doesn't mean final in this case. And so what's getting approved now is kind of a monthly amount. And certainly, you know, obviously there were objections to it. But no one has gotten final approval. Everything remains subject to disgorgement. Everything at this time. I appreciate that, Your Honor. And I'm not making up the rules. I'm just – this is the way it kind of works. I think my original point was it was in – it was in argument to their excuse that, well, it's in the record, so it must be innocent. We didn't have anything to hide. The point is, though, it's not on the burden 
of someone in the equity committee to dig through records to disclose Ms. Freeman's involvement once it's public record that there could be serious questions about her connection to Judge Jones and a connection to this case. And there's appearance of impropriety. And the fact that I, I, I would disagree, and I, for the record, I believe the rule, rule, the intention of the rule, including the Balco case and the Leslie case. We're, we're textualists. We, we, I, the intent of the rule, what is that? Well, we well the rule requires point. anyone employed to, to, to disclose. Ms. Freeman, for all intents and purposes, was employed. No, 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 but, but, but your connections with, but you, you have to disclose your connections, right? And this was a serious connection. Ms. Freeman to Judge Jones is a serious no, but, connection. But that's, but that's not, I agree. That's certainly true. But, but the lawyers disclosing, I, I, I need to kind of just clarify something. I, and I got I to gotta be really careful because I, I realized that I got appealed on something. Um, and so I, I don't want to talk about that just out of the same way. Part of what I thought was different about, but or the reason I, well, let me, let, me not, let me put away that motion. At the very beginning, the reason I was asking questions from the equity committee that I thought, and I thought were different than quite frankly you or, or right, is, is that there were people who were there kind of on the ground in mediation kind of observing stuff. And, and so I can see someone like you, like looking at the docket saying, what in the world is going on here? I'm diving in. I don't see this. I wasn't involved in day-to-day -day conversations. I wasn't going on. And so um, uh, I, I know you, you, you quoted the, the kind of where's the smoke stuff. What my intent was there, and I don't want to talk about the substance of the ruling or any of that. It was kind of, you know, was there something from your day-to-day -day that makes you now say, Someone there, right? You know, in terms of was it our motion filed? Because I'm seeing, you know, Jones, Jones, you know, you know, they, they filed, they started a an adversary proceeding, but then it gets dismissed really fast. I saw, you know, uh, request for 2004s. I just signed some more now uh, related to Silex. You know, people are, and, and I don't see anything. And so I'm saying, is there something from someone who has from 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 boots on the ground, which I think is different than the United States trustee who's going to come in and say. You know, we're, we're kind of the watchdog piece or, or an equity holder saying, I've been monitoring the case, but I don't, you know, I'm sit around and, and have confidential conversations in mediation. I just think there was a difference. And, and that's what my intention was there. I, I, I view you different than members of, I'm not saying anybody did a wrong job or anything bad. It was just, that was the, the basis of the questioning. I understand. Thank you for that clarification, Your Honor. And I, I don't want to belabor the point. And maybe you can help me with this, but in, in the form orders of retention, there's language that's stricken from, uh, for example, uh, an Exhibit example. 21. Uh, all right, let me go to 21. And this may just mean me from the outside no, no, looking no. in. Let's, let's take a look at it together. Exhibit 21. Yes, paragraph 3. That's a Latham and Watkins retention as an example. It's, all, it's in the Jackson uh, Walker retention. Uh, okay. well, let's, I know. Or you can do 18 if you want to look at Jackson no, no, Walker. No. I'm just going back to the original application. I think this is the whole. So may I proceed? No, no, no. I'm just going to tell you. I oh, okay. Can, I can tell you. I can show this. It used to be an old relic that when you had to provide stuff to people, you had to do it in leads, like a searchable leads format, the billing records in support of fee applications, and that's what got struck. This whole you got to – this is the portion that actually got struck here. It was on the original, the proposed application on 226. It looks like he signed the order, but he struck this, like, your billing records shall use open and open searchables and leads or electronic data probate. It was kind of an old relic of when you did the old, you could file something on the docket, and it was like in the PDF, you couldn't do searchable PDFs. And so that they would ask for, like, U.S. trustee and others reform, ask for, like, leads so that you could they could kind of merge it into their old system and then and get something on the docket. I suspect that's what that was. And, but I guess my point with that is, I know it's not as easy, I don't think, as just hitting Control F to search these billing records because they weren't required to be presented in searchable format. So you literally, if you don't know anything about uh, technology or information technology, you've got you don't know how to convert something from a PDF that is not searchable to something that is searchable. Because my understanding, and I can't say this for myself because it wasn't me that found the entries, it was the equity committee that it was not easily searchable by just hitting control F and lo looking for names. So I think that I don't want to belabor this point because I understand. No, I got it. And, and I haven't done, I haven't done the research either, but I, I know normally when something gets uploaded on CMECF by, by these firms that you can, you can search it. But I, 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 I have not done that work. So I, I, I won't make a representation one way or the other about that. Right. So I, I, I want to talk real briefly about a couple of the leading bankruptcy cases, which you know better than me. Um, the N. Ray Leslie Fay Companies case and the N. Ray Balco Equities case that stands for the proposition that I don't have to prove any damages to the estate or to myself to prove uh, the rule violation. And I, I, I respectfully disagree with the court for the record. 
that there is no burden on the part of Latham Watkins and M3 and Mr. Medji to amend their disclosures after it's publicly available and, no, and it's public knowledge and in the reports that Ms. Freeman and, and there's been allegations, and serious allegations, including the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, that Ms. Freeman and Judge Jones were in a relationship during the pendency of this case. And I, as an attorney, I'm not a bankruptcy attorney, so I want, I want to clarify that. I'm not a bankruptcy attorney. But my understanding of the rule is, is that it's not just, it's in the record, you've got to go look for it, that Ms. Freeman worked on the case. It's, you know she worked on the case, and now it's public that she's involved with Judge Jones, so it's on you as the counsel to disclose and, 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 and disclose because you're employing her, whether you pay her or not. The spirit of the rule, employment, I don't think employment is defined, but I would say if she's being consulted on the case and she's being strongly recommended to be retained and she's talking about substantive issues, and if there, she's not employed, then you've got questions about violations of attorney-client privilege if you're talking to a lawyer that doesn't have authorization to receive information about the case. There's a many problems involved here. And so what, what the Balco court clearly states, quote, so important is the duty of disclosure that the failure to disclose relevant connections is an independent basis for the disallowance of fees or even disqualification. And that's the type of remedy I'm seeking is sanctions. The court on its own motion can do it with the information I've provided. It's not on just me to, to uh, ask for these sanctions. And even the negligent omissions are considered violations under the disclosure rules. In the Fifth Circuit, under, in the Consolidated Bank Shares case, the Fifth Circuit says, quote, professionals engaged in the conduct of a bankruptcy case should be free of the slightest personal interest, which might be reflected in their decisions concerning matters of the debtor's estate, or which might impair the high degree of impartiality and detached judgment expected of them during the course of administration. That includes the CRO, that includes counsel for debtor, that includes everyone in the case, free of the slightest personal interest. And the evidence I presented here today certainly raises at minimum a high degree of suspicion, if not more than adequate proof, that Latham and Watkins, Jackson Walker, and M3 partners, including Mr. Meggie, engaged in conduct when consulting with Ms. Freeman that was not free of the slightest personal interest. Latham and Watkins and M3 partners asked this court to just take their word for it. And they've presented two uh, statements, uh, sworn statements in this case. But, and the, and that, that's, that should be all we get. No further discovery. Let's move on. Let's just go towards liquidation because that's, that's what they want to do at this point. But this is unacceptable given the facts I've submitted here today and the current cloud lingering over the Southern District. This, there's a disturbing pattern here, Judge. Ms. Freeman is consulted on issues like litigation strategy, entry of orders, edits to motions and declarations, retention application for Jackson and Walker, and in almost every instance, the issue or motion is pending before Judge Jones that same day or the day after. And it's fair to assume that every evening after these various consultations with Ms. Freeman, she would go home to her live-in romantic partner, Judge Jones, the very judge presiding over this case. And if that is not required, once this is known in the record, and keep in mind, Judge, this was only after the Equity Committee confronted Ms. Reckler that this was even known. No, yeah, they put it in their billing. They stuck it in the court file. But who's... Again, we're not looking line by line at records when we're not looking for Ms. Freeman. We had no idea Ms. Freeman was going to be a problem until we get, and then when it becomes public, they say nothing for a month. And, and look at the response I got. Well, I don't want to go there. I don't want to say anything. And then lastly, Your Honor, uh, Exhibit 22, this is a publicly filed document. These are statements, in op considered statements in open court by attorneys for Jackson Walker. Oh, yes, yes, yes. This was filed on... November 13th, 2023, as they're doing damage control. Going down, for, I'll point to paragraph two. Towards the end of that paragraph, beginning with, as a result, Jackson Walker did, this is statements by Jackson Walker and their attorneys in the court record. Jackson Walker did not know of any ongoing intimate relationships between Ms. Freeman and Judge Jones until 2022. So we know right there that they're admitting that in 2022 they did know. That's before this case was ever filed. Then going down to paragraph 16, notwithstanding the above confirmation with Ms. Freeman and actions taken by Jackson Walker, months later in 2022, 
a credible third party volunteered new information to Jackson Walker partner, which led Jackson Walker to again question Ms. Freeman about these allegations. Ms. Freeman again denied any current intimate relationship with Judge Jones. When Jackson Walker continued to question Ms. Freeman, she ultimately admitted that the relationship had resumed. So she denied and then she admits. They know in, uh, in 2022 that Ms. Freeman admits she's in a relationship with Judge Jones. And yet in 2023, they are still pushing for her to be involved and not just pushing for her to be involved, Your Honor, they're consulting her in this case. And that is absolutely inappropriate. And there should be sanctions, at least as to Jackson Walker, they should be removed from this case. Their fees should be disgorged under the rules. I really appreciate your your honor's indulgence. I appreciate your time. No, I appreciate you. I appreciate your time and our, our discussion. I uh, I just want to sum it up by saying I'm kind of in a conundrum, and I don't I don't mind being frank with everybody here. I'm, I'm trying to get discovery, and I certainly want that discovery because I think we're entitled to that discovery. However, and and I think we're talking out loud here because obviously I see that the court doesn't have a problem with just open, frank discussions. I, I truly believe that the evidence that we have that I presented here today, including their own declarations, Mr. Meggie and Ms. Reckler, that they admitted that by October 6th, they knew about the relationship in the public, at least by then they knew, and they did nothing. They did nothing to let us know. They did nothing to disclose that Ms. Freeman was in this case. We didn't suspect that. The equity committee didn't initial. No one has it suspected that before October 6th. But when we get the news on October 6th, everyone's antennas go up. I would suggest, Your Honor, and I, I, I truly, and I will go back and look at some research on, on the cases that talk about these rules, but I, I truly believe the, the spirit of the rules to require open and clear disclosure by bankruptcy professionals is violated when you don't disclose someone who's been outed that's worked on this case and worked on it in several different important areas of, of the subject matter of this case. And so I believe the court ha can do on its, can take me out of the conundrum that I'm in, because I want the discovery. But I also don't want to put, put, put in the position that, well, you either get your discovery or you have to go forward now and stick with what, what you have and then leave it up to whether or not you're going to get your relief as to Latham Watkins and, and, and Mr. Medji and M3 partners. But I would suggest that the court on its own can do the job, that I don't have to be the one. I want the discovery, and I, and I still ask for that discovery that I've reasonably presented to Ms. Reckler, and there may be additional discovery, follow-up discovery that I will do in an expedited, very narrow manner. I'm not going carpet bombing on, on a bunch of documents, but I, I, I want to make sure that I at least get the discovery, but I do believe, for the record, the evidence that has been presented even and, and even the own declarations of the lawyers that they have violated the rules as of October the 6th and not disclosed Ms. Freeman's relationship until November. And even then, in November, on November 7th, when they're confronted, because let's assume November 7th never happened. No one looked at the billing records. Do you think we would have ever known that Ms. Freeman was working in this case from the moment they filed the lawsuit? That's problematic. That's problematic because there could have been. I'm not saying there was nefarious action. Okay, I, I, I guess the appearance of impropriety is so important. I've got, two, I've got two questions for you. One is, I think you mentioned that there was an email where the member of the equity committee emailed Ms. Reckler and said, tell me what's going on. Is that in the record? Yes, that's exhibit C to, um, let me go back. It's a document number. It's in the, it's in uh, Mr. Glenn's motion and he attached his, it was uh, Mr. Glenn. That, that's, that's not in our, in our record today, right? Oh, it's in my brief. It's in, it's in the record in the motion. So, uh, I, oh, yes, yes, I remember. That. But I, I guess I got the point. And so okay. what I'm saying is absent him confronting Ms. Reckler, I, 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 but, I but, guarantee but, you we wouldn't have known Ms. Freeman was involved. But then you're, then you're telling me he's not looking at the bills. No, I mean, he, it's not gonna, I mean realistically, are we looking at every name? No, no, not you, the, the equity committee. I'm sorry? The equity committee. It's, 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 it's there a, would be no reason to. to, to no, 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 no. There's, there's, there's every reason for an, for an official committee of, of equity security holders, an official committee to look at the bills in this case. Absolutely, and they're astronomical in this case. No, no, case. but what I'm saying is, but, but, so in other words, it's, it's the part that I'm wrestling with, it, right, right, like you, you get the bills, you, the, the order says you gotta get the bills, and it's for, then you can't tell me, well, you, you'll, I know I'm supposed to have them, and I got them, but I didn't, you know, I didn't know, I wouldn't have known, you know, what, yeah, I get you saying that. I don't get an official, like the official committee of unsecured creditors can come in 
and say, you know, I mean, that, that's why we sign these interim compensation procedures so people they can then either see them publicly filed on the docket and then there are certain parties that just have to have it served on them, right? And so that's the part. And I don't want, and no one's here from the equity committee, and I, and I think it'd be unfair uh, to put on one of what they know and what they didn't know and, and, and did they know. I get you saying it, and that's why I'm saying I, I view you all in, in different buckets. I appreciate that. And I think, I don't think it's reasonable to expect anyone scrutinizing the bills for reasonableness is going to remember every name of every person that's listed on hundreds of lines of billing to say, oh, Ms. Freeman's there, and so we got to raise the red flags. They had no reason to question Ms. Freeman until the news came out, and when, and when it came out, nothing was, do- I mean, nothing was done by the lawyers who knew Ms. Freeman was involved and consulted with her actively to tell the court, oops, she's involved, it's innocent, we're gonna, but we're going to fully disclose that. That wasn't done here, Your Honor, and that's the problem. Um, I, I appreciate your time. I oh, certainly no. do. And I, so I, I want the discovery, Your Honor. I believe I am entitled to the discovery that I've compelled. I'm asking from a technical standpoint that the documents that, I, that, that are produced are produced in their original format. I, will pres- I think in my proposed order, I, I think I have some language in there that says I want the metadata on emails, I want the metadata on any text messages because I've had this experience in other cases that I've had and litigated where I've had to look at documents and if they produce me a photo shot, photo shot of the document or some uh, reproduced PDF, it will not show me to authenticate whether that document has been changed, altered in any way. So I would ask that I may revise the proposed order for the judge, but I want to make sure that I get the actual copy of the raw metadata of the file because I have experts that will examine that to tell me they're, if they're authentic or not uh, because I do want to get to the truth your honor but as to Jackson Walker absolutely they need to have their fees disgorged they need to be removed and that needs to happen effective immediately and I'm, I know I've taken enough of your time this morning oh, yeah. um, I know there's a standing issues which that, that hurdles yeah. cross. okay all right thank you your honor I appreciate it Anyone else wish to be heard? All right, so if you can just get close to a mic, I just want to make sure we can all hear you. For the record, Chris Harris of Latham and Watkins for the debtors. Before I turn to argument, I would like to move into evidence uh, our exhibits. I, I really just need exhibit 1784-2, which is Ms. Reckler's declaration. She's available for cross-examination here in the courtroom. And then the declaration of Mr. Mo Meji of M3, which is at 1784-1. And he's also here in the courtroom and available for cross-examination. Let me just say, before anybody comes in, there are folks who are maybe dialing in for a 3 o'clock hearing. Uh, I'm going to push that hearing till 3.30 p.m. If you're dialing in for the 3 p.m. case, I'm going to push it out till 3.30. I'm not going to begin before 3.30 p.m. to just give everyone an opportunity to um, do that. If any of my clerks are listening, go outside. You'll see there'll be people in the hallway, and, and you can let them know that I'm not going to start on that 3 o'clock till 3.30. Thank you. Well, Your Honor, I just have one point on, mm-hmm. on Ms. Reckler being available for cross-examination on this declaration. Mm-hmm. I would reserve the right, if I decide not to cross-examine her today, mm-hmm. that I reserve the right to cross-examine her in a future discovery if necessary, because all that's being presented is a very short declaration, and I do not have documents to cross-examine her properly at this time. So I reserve the right just in case I'm told, oh, you had a chance to depose her or question her, and you didn't do it. I don't know how it works in bankruptcy, but I don't want to lose the opportunity. I will get your, 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 we'll see how it goes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. I just want to start by resetting where we, why we are here. So we're on a motion to compel document requests that are in support of Mr. Culberson's Rule 60B6 motion, the only purpose for these document requests, and that seeks to vacate the orders approving the debtor's retention of their professionals. And the discovery sought from the debtors, Latham and Watkins and Jackson Walker, but it also, by the wording of it, includes requests for M3's documents. Jackson Walker is here, and I'll defer to them regarding the discovery as to them, but I be- at the status conference, I believe Mr. Culberson said he did not need more discovery, but I will leave it up to Jackson Walker to address. I'm just here to address M3 and Latham on behalf of the debtors. And regarding Latham and M3, the requests essentially seek every document, including emails and calendar entries about Ms. Freeman. And again, specific to M3 and Latham, these document requests are only relevant if the predicate assumption is true, 
that M3 and Latham knew about the relationship between Ms. Freeman and Judge Jones before it was disclosed in the media. If, if they weren't aware, then none of the evidence that he's seeking, when was Ms. Freeman consulted, what meetings were there, what could she handle, They're re none of them are relevant at all to whether the retention order should be vacant. Previously represented in live, live court that we didn't know, we've introduced into evidence uncontroverted declarations from the people leading the engagements for Latham and M3 that no one knew and they conducted an investigation and not only did they not know, but no one at their firms knew of this relationship. And I think that is critically important because we need to remember the context here, which is this a rule, this is a rule 60 B6 motion. That is a that is a savings clause in Rule 60B. It's intended to catch a fraud on the court. That's what the Fifth Circuit held in Rozier v. Ford Mortar Co., 573 F. 2nd, 1332 at 1338. Why is that relevant? Well, it's because the fraud on the court standard of Rule 60B6 is extremely high. I'm going to quote the Fifth Circuit from that Rozier case. It was quoting another case, U.S. v. ITT. But this is what the Fifth Circuit quoted as what this 60B6 standard is. Generally speaking, only the most egregious misconduct, such as bribery of a judge or members of a jury, or the fabrication of evidence by a party in which an attorney is implicated, will constitute a fraud on the court. Less egregious misconduct, such as a non-disclosure to the court of facts allegedly pertinent to the matter before it, will not ordinarily rise to the level of fraud on the court. Okay, so that's what we're talking about here, a Rule 60B6 motion. And without knowing about the relationship, nothing about the facts of her consultation is at all relevant to whether a fraud was committed on the court. I don't think there's any dispute that Ms. Freeman is an experienced and respected bankruptcy attorney in the Houston Bar, including being chambers ring. There's no dispute that as far as Latham know, she was associated in some way with Jackson Walkers and was available as a resource. And as the timesheets that Mr. Culberson has shown, it demonstrates she was consulted on areas within that expertise of procedure, form of declarations, motions to seal. How did the, how did the U.S. Tr trustee here deal with the formation of the uh, UCC? Entries of orders, all things that you would expect to consult with the local council. And the consultations themselves were quite small. I think, again, those exhibits that Mr. Culberson introduced reflect that there were 2.3 hours of consultation between Latham and Ms. Freeman. So, I'll be brief, but I have, I have three points why the motion to compel should be denied and our cross motion for protective order. As to M3 and late. First is discovery is not needed for the Rule 60B6 motion. That's what Mr. Culberson said in that discovery motion, and I take him at his word. And we cited cases indicating that when there is not a need for the discovery for the motion on which it's sought, that's a basis to deny it. That's the Treadway case that we cited. Second point, and this is the most important point, is it's not relevant. As I said, none of the discovery is relevant and Latham and M3 were aware of the relationship before it became public. And the undisputed evidentiary record is that neither Latham nor M3 were aware. If you look at Rule 26, the discovery must be relevant to a party's claim or defense, be proportional to the needs of the case, considering the importance of the issues, the amount of controversy, and whether the burden or expense of the proposed discovery outweighs its benefit. We cited the Flambeau case in addition. There is no articulation of how this discovery is relevant if we were not aware and M3 was not aware of the relationship. We've had an hour and a half of argument and still no articulation that if that assumption is wrong, why is any of this relevant? And even if there was some marginal relevance Rule 26 to the 60B6 motion, Rule 26 still requires that you balance that against the burden and expense. And so the if we had even heard some reason why it might be relevant without that predicate assumption, it would still need to be balanced against the burden of cost, the intrusion on counsel, and on the CRO of this. The last point is privilege, and this is also critical. Every, essentially every document that he's asking for is privileged. To the extent there is anything non-privileged in them, like the date of the communications, the subject matter of them, that is already disclosed in the time records. So what he's asking for beyond what's already disclosed is entirely privileged. She was, Ms. Freeman was involved in the provision of legal advice to the, count, to the debtors. The fact that she was not retained by an order of the court means she is not getting paid, but she was still representing the debtors. And those privileged, those communications are privileged. And we cited several cases saying that 
That's a basis to deny discovery when essentially the entire request of discovery would be privileged. And then just to address a few of the specific points that he raised, I, I think it's probably all clear from the discussion the court already had. But Mr. Culberson's suspicion that the case was not randomly assigned, there is simply no evidence whatever to support that. Nor is it clear how it would even be relevant to whether Latham or M3 was aware of the relationship. As for forum shopping, the document requests that he served don't go into that, and nor would that be evidence to support a Rule 60b-6 motion. If he wants to file a motion to transfer, that's a different issue. But the motion that he seeks the discovery on is not a motion to transfer. As for the fact that Ms. Freeman and Ms. Reckler were both on the complex case committee, so were over 20 other people, including at least 10 other non-Texan lawyers. And the actual fact is Ms. Reckler was suggested by Judge Isger, who has had many cases with Ms. Reckler. As for the early consultation with Ms. Freeman on litigation strategy and mediation, there's nothing nefarious there. That was about how could we initiate a mediation in the Southern District of Texas. That was a critical issue at the very beginning of the case because the case was triggered by and driven by, at that time, the Nant litigations. And there are different approaches in different bankruptcy courts about whether to issue mediation orders and on what basis. As for the March 11th call, which had those sealed documents, I can at least say the topic of it, which was the Silicon Valley Bank situation. And in fact, we had Ms. Freeman reach out to the U.S. trustee to get approval for us to use certain bank accounts to salvage that situation, which was critical to saving the company at that point. No one was trying to hide her involvement. And just to be clear, those documents under seal were shared with the equity committee. As far as the questions about the UCC reconstitution, we reached out to her because every U.S. trustee deals with the Constitution and changes to an equity committee somewhat differently. As the fact that we consulted with her at various times before orders were filed, that is literally exactly what you would do with local counsel. I believe in every case where we have local counsel, we ask local counsel to review our orders before we file them. Again, that is the, one of the most critical things you do with local counsel. As to the Jones -Walker, I'm sorry, Jackson Walker retention letter, I'll let them speak to that, but it, it's clear it was a pre-petition engagement letter before the case was assigned to Jones. And the language about Ms. Friedman as suggesting as counsel, conflict counsel was obviously there in case instead the case was assigned to a different judge. If it has any relevance, it would show that they didn't know that the case would be assigned to Judge Jones. And then as to Rule 2014, which I think was really what is now being argued at this point, what should Latham and M3 have done after October 6th? They say we needed to disclose that Ms. Friedman was consulted on this matter. Just before I get to that rule, that is not a basis for Rule 60b-6 motion. As I, as I discussed, the standard for that is extremely high. And it is not satisfied just by a failure to disclose some pertinent fact. That's what the Fifth Circuit is saying. In addition, there has been no violation of Rule 2014. Rule 2014 says to disclose your contacts and your relationships or anyone that you employ. Ms. Freeman's relationship with Judge Jones is not something that Latham or M3 would disclose because she was not employed by Latham or M3 or the debtors, for that matter, who never paid her. We had no more information of this than anyone else. As for whether we should have disclosed that she was consulted, as Your Honor has pointed out, that was publicly known on the docket. We heard Mr. Culbertson say, well, fine, it was publicly known, but, there, but no one would have cared looking at those time records unless they knew her role. I think what he said exactly was, there was no reason to question her involvement until the relationship was known. That is exactly our point. We also did not know and had no reason to question her involvement. In addition to the fact that the time records were publicly disclosed and clearly could be knowable to anyone as shown by the Equity Committee reaching out to us, we understood that she had reached out to the U.S. trustee already to disclose her involvement in all cases, including surrender. In addition to that, as the time records reflect, the U.S. Uh, the, the US trustee had communications with her, Nance Council had communications with her, the UCC lead council had communications with her. There was nothing secret about her involvement. And even when Ms. Mr. Glenn reached out to Ms. Reckler, she immediately responded and said, yes, she was involved. Last point in terms of the sort of 
things that have given Mr. Colbert con concern, Exhibit 21, the Latham retention order, and that it struck out that language saying that things should be filed in a searchable manner. The order we filed had that language, and then it was struck out by the court as not necessary, I suppose. But to the extent this has any relevance to whether Latham knew something, it would suggest the opposite. The form order that we submitted had language having that it be disclosed. So just backing up, this is discovery sought in connection with Rule 60b-6 motion. There has to be some reason for it to be relevant. And without the predicate of any evidence that Latham or M3 knew about this relationship, which they did not, and the only evidence is that they did not, there's not a basis for that discovery. And I'll let Jackson Walker cover their discovery. Thank you very much. Your Honor, Chris Bankler from Jackson Walker. Am I correct, Your Honor, in just making sure that procedurally I have this right? We're just talking about the discovery. You don't, I, I think I heard you say a couple times today, we're not taking up the merits of the 60B and you don't expect substantive argument on that today. I'm going to rule on the, on the objection. I'm going to rule on the, talk about the disclosure. Talk about the, the discovery. discovery first. The discovery, yes, Your Honor. Your Honor, I think, I think that that's a pretty simple uh, argument as it comes to Jackson Walker. Mr. Culberson stood up here less than a week ago and said to this court, as to Jackson Walker, my position is I don't need any further discovery. So we agree with him and we therefore believe that it would be inappropriate for this court to order any further discovery because he's told this court he doesn't need any discovery from Jackson Walker. That's not what he said today. And let's not, that, that's not what he said today. He just I, stood up, he just stood up and argued a bunch of other stuff <laughs> saying, he, you should be discouraged and, and he needs to get information and he's looking for information and when he made that statement and, I, and I'm trying to I'm trying to be fair to both sides here when he made that statement he was wondering like judge if we're gonna go for it on the 60b I'll go at what I got but I but he filed the motion seeking discovery I can't I can't <laughs> he didn't withdraw the motion it's it's kind of you know judge if, look I, I still think I can win if you based on the stuff that I've got it's, it's it was more in that in that spirit fair enough your honor and, I, and I'm not trying to be unfair I, 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 I know I, you're not I also heard him say that he said he he wants discovery but he doesn't need discovery and so I, I just wanted to make that that point clear otherwise I, I I don't think that I would be doing anything other than repeating the arguments that you've just heard on the discovery why it's not relevant to the 60b motion and and why it, it's not necessary at this point in time as you said he stood up here and he argued a lot of other things things that I'm I'm sure is no surprise to you your honor that we don't believe are factually accurate or misstatements or misquoting or mischaracterizing the evidence uh, a lot of it is simply not evidence it's his belief and speculation about facts I don't believe your honor based off of what you said about not getting into the merits would like me to try to go through and respond to all of that argument here right now but uh, I, I certainly want to make sure that I'm following the court yeah no, no. I, I, let me let me let me make a couple of rulings here so there were a couple of motions before the court let me just note that the court has jurisdiction under these Motions under 28 U.S.C. 1334, certainly core proceedings matters affecting uh, administration of the estate under 28 U.S.C. 157b2. Um, there, there are two kind of motions that, that, that are that are set before the court today: a motion for emergency relief under uh, 60b6 and uh, Rule 9024, for relief from the orders approving um, the applications. For Jackson Walker, Latham and Walker, and M3, and a motion to, to kind of disgorge the fees and expenses there therein, and that was filed at docket number 1656. Um, and I want to just kind of highlight uh, a couple of points here. Now, what that motion is specifically re re requesting was filed by Mr. Tim Cumberson, and there were some questions about whether Mr. Cumberson was a party in interest. That 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 hurdle has been cleared. He I consider him a party in interest, and he and certainly. Uh, seek that. It, it's seeking the disgorgement of all fees and expenses received by Jackson Walker, Latham Watkins, and M3 since their retention, disgorgement of all fees and expenses they've received since confirmation and representation of the, the plan agent, disqualifying them as counsel and CRO, uh, retroactive to the first day they were retained. So I'll take that as kind of just kind of undoing their retention application and prohibiting Jackson Walker, Latham, and M3 from continuing any appearances or involvement in this case. And, and so then that was at file 1656 at, at set around a couple of, that motion was filed um, on an emergency basis uh, on December 14th. The court on its own kind of pushed this out onto normal notice. I thought it was important enough and Mr. Krobison was, was, had no issues with that. I'm just kind of noting procedurally kind of where we are. Separately at docket number, about a week later, 
docket 1700, Mr. Kerperson filed a motion to compel where he sought um, documents um, and basically said, well, Your Honor, if you're not going to let me get documents, I, I need I need documents in the alternative. If you don't want to grant the 60 Bs, then, then give me the opportunity to to um, to compel documents. The parties have objected to that. I'll, I'll start with kind of the, the, the motions to compel because that's kind of where, where I started. Well, I held a status conference about a week ago to address certain matters with respect to how cases are assigned. I'm going to incorporate, rather than reiterate, I'm just going to incorporate the statements that are available on the transcript. And if they're not written on the transcript, there's not a written copy, I will order one so that the parties have everything I said. I will incorporate those findings, or those statements that I made into findings here today about how cases are assigned and how sometimes they, the form uh, shows that I am the judge even in cases that were assigned, allegedly assigned to me 10 years before I became a judge. Um, therein, um, I, I'm also representing. Um, I, I've, I've done some digging internally, and I've spoken to the clerk of the court about fixing the form. I've also reviewed the docket myself and did some internal looking. I, I didn't get this case. I, I was not assigned this case. Had I gotten the case, I'd have done my job and, and kept the case. I, I understand why that's confusing. And I'm, hopefully my statements, for whatever they're worth, will we'll get to the right parties and, and that will get addressed. I do agree with Mr. Krobus, and I think you're going to timestamp something it's a national form, so it's not just the Southern District of Texas form. And, and if there's a national form, I think it would be best to show, you know, who the initial judge is, and if there was a subsequent judge, then then you can so that people can have timestamps as to when it um, shows kind of when a certain judge was appointed. Kind of, I think mir mirroring kind of what the judge link does when it shows when something was assigned and unassigned. But there's a footprint on the docket there, so um, there, there's a, a motion to compel um, documentation in, in connection with the 60B6 motion, um, and I would note, uh, and I'll cite some law here, Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 60 applies to bankruptcy cases through Federal Bank Rule of Bankruptcy Procedure 9024, uh, which is, again, not easy to find, but <laughs> we know that it's there. Uh, 60B6 is a general catch-all phrase, and it's reserved for, quote-unquote, extraordinary circumstances. That's the standard the Supreme Court set in a case, for example, Buck versus Davis, 580 U.S. 100. 123 pinpoint site 2017 case. You can also find it in Fifth Circuit case like Diaz v. Stevens, 731 F3rd 370, pin site 374, uh, Fifth Circuit 2013. I'm going to read things into the record. There'll be an audio recording available. I'm also going to order a transcript so that the parties have the availability uh, to see it. The uh, Rule 60B6, uh, the Fifth Circuit said in Case called Yesh Music versus Lakewood Church, 727 F3rd 356, Penn site 363 at the Fifth Circuit 2013 case. And Rule 60B6 is, is a grand reservoir of equitable power to do justice in a particular case. However, we've also narrowly circumscribed its, circumscribed its availability, holding that 60B6 relief will only be granted only if extraordinary circumstances are present. Accordingly, 60B6 requires a showing of manifest injustice will not be used to relieve a party from free, calculated, and deliberate choices someone's made. Um, that, that's the standard where, where we are. Uh, these applications, uh, three applications were, were approved by former Judge Jones, approving the retention application of Latham and Watkins and M3 and Jackson Walker. Uh, I, I would note... Um, now, with respect to Latham and M3, I'm going to take Jackson Walker aside for a minute. Um, no, no party has questioned that, that at the time that the declaration were made, I have no evidence that, that, that they that there's anything in any any disclosure in there that was improper or or, or incorrect. Uh, 327 requires a party to be disinterested, and disinterested is defined in the bankruptcy code as, as, as not being an, an equity holder, a, a secure creditor, or having an interest adverse to, to the estate. Uh, bankruptcy Rule 2014, which is um, promulgated a rule that used in connection with employment for applications under Rule 327, uh, provides that in order approving the employment of attorneys, accountants, appraisers, auctioneers, agents, or other pro pro uh, professionals uh, must be made on the application. On uh, the application and um, the application must state facts specific showing the necessity for the employment, the name of the person to be employed, 
the reasons for the selection, the professional services to be rendered, any proposed arrangement for compensation, and to the best of the applicant's knowledge, all of the person's connections with the debtor, creditors, and any other party in interest. Right? It's the, it's the professional's connections to any other party in interest, their respective attorneys and accountants, the United States trustee, or any other person uh, employed in the office of the United States trustee. Uh, the application has to be accompanied by a verified statement of the person to be employed, setting forth those connections. So no one's questioning for M3 or, or Latham and Watkins whether uh, those those disclosures were made proper. I, uh, Mr. Culverson, um, I, I, and I guess I should back up one point and say uh, that in matters of Fifth Circuit also gives us some guidance on how we kind of read rules, and, and I am... I'm not as textualist as, as they come. I believe that's what the Supreme Court is requiring me to do. Um, but in interpreting statutes and rules, you begin with the text, and you get cases like Whitlock versus Lowe, 945 F3rd, 943, 947, a Fifth Circuit 2019 case that says, in matters of statutory interpretation, text is always the alpha. Um, the bedrock, LTD versus United States, 541 U.S. 176, Pinpoint 183, 2004 case, it says the preeminent canon of statutory interpretation requires to presume that the legislature says in a statute what it means and a statute what it says there. So that, that, that's what, and, and again, these rules are promulgated by the Supreme Court. They're not statutes, but, but the, the, the statutory analysis remains the same. You kind of read things very literally. Um, this court, and again, I, I read the text and, and I interpret the text, and, and, and that's what we do. I, I don't deviate much uh, into kind of what the spirit of, of things mean. I, I read what they say, and I use canons of statutory interpretation. When I need to know what a word means, I look it up in the dictionary, uh, determine what the ordinary plain meaning is at the time. That's the way I think you can call, quite frankly, balls and strikes when, you, when you're interpreting statutes, when you just kind of do your job as the judge, and you Read, this, read the statutes and you read the commas carefully and you, you, you follow the rules of grammar carefully and, and if anyone wants changes, you, 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 you go to folks who, who make changes, which is Congress or uh, the rules, the folks who make the bankruptcy rules. And judges just, are, my job is to just interpret what is said and to read it literally and if anybody wants changes to them, then, then you got to go to the changing making powers and that way um, the separation of powers works um, efficiently. So, Anyway, that's what the rule says. Uh, I would note um, that there's a lot of talk uh, of October the 6th and and when kind of things came out regarding uh, the very public nature of what was took place with, uh, or what is alleged with, with Judge Jones and, and Elizabeth Freeman. Now, I do know Jackson Walker uh, takes has denied uh, a number of allegations. Uh, I know Judge Jones has based upon what I read in the Fifth Circuit, has uh, admitted to certain things, but those are um, those statements are being played out and what the ramifications with respect to Judge Jones is playing out in litigation that is not before me, that is pending before a United States District Court judge from the Western District of Texas who is um, has agreed to kind of review a very serious matter um, that's, that's all I'll say about that. Those are very serious allegations, very serious matters, and that, that will run its course. I, I don't know anything. Um, I'll state for the record, I, I have not seen Judge Jones since he left the building. And I wasn't here when everything happened on October the 6th. Uh, I remember the day really well because I turned 50 and I was in a funeral home planning my mother's funeral, um, who had passed away a couple of days ago. A couple of days earlier, I came back and I had not seen Judge Jones uh, since he left the building. And so, I, I, when I took over this case, I was um, just doing the very best that I could to try to get up to speed, reading dockets, reading cases, trying to get up to speed. So, the, the question before the, the court um, is, you know, did what was going on on October the sixth require any updating? In the rules, and again, you're looking at this through manifest injustice, uh, extraordinary circumstances. Uh, I, I don't read the rules to require it for M3 or or Jackson Walker. The rules just don't require it. I do know, uh, and I would have been very uh, uncomfortable uh, 
you know, if there were, you know, if there were kind of amended, applic you know, applications or fee statements filed afterwards to kind of add in Freeman statements, you know, seven months after, you know, you know, um, but that's not what we have. We have uh, interim compensation procedures, and those bills were, were sent to members, statutory members of the committee and filed publicly uh, on the docket. I, I do understand uh, Mr. Kobus's statements. They, they are long and cumbersome. There's no question about that. Um, they're not unique. Uh, Our so, system yeah. will end this conference in five minutes. To extend this call, your conference has been expanded for 60 minutes. Sorry about that. Um, so the rules don't require, but but the question is, and kind of, you know, but is there something there that, that gives rise to a potential colorable claim with respect to these professionals? And I've, I've again, asked this of a lot of professionals who are on the ground day to day. I know the trustee is kind of working through a lot of issues with respect to Jackson Walker, and 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 I, I review the docket, I review the evidence, the declarations that are admitted, and what I have are people saying I I didn't know. I did not know about this. I know that it'd be hard to believe um, for some people. Um, you know, how could you not know, right? And that's what people are saying. But I, I think that's easier than I, I think. If for folks on the ground, that um, that's not a far-fetched statement that people wouldn't have known. Um, at least what's alleged. Uh, and I got it. I don't want to get into the merits of it. I, I don't have any evidence or. No findings have been made by a court or any of that stuff. And I'm just being highly technical here because I want to be respectful. I don't want anyone to go out there and say Lopez said that there, this happened or this happened. I have no idea. I'm telling you, I came back and put my head down and got to work. That's what I did. Got assigned, reassigned a bunch of cases, this being one of them. And I don't see any colorable claim with respect to M3. And I don't see one with, with Latham. I got it. People were having conversations, but that doesn't strike me as out of the, the norm to have been speaking. I don't see any rulings here that, that strike as odd. But, you know, again, I, I, I listened very carefully to what Mr. Uh, Mr. Duran from the Office of the United States Trustee, which is an arm of the Department of Justice, said, I've got no issues now. But maybe things come out and things change and, and folks will file motions and we'll, we'll take them up at that time. But I don't see anything now. Um, and so and when you kind of look at stuff through a lens of 60B6, manifest injustice, and based upon people talking and having questions, I, I get it. Um, I, I don't think it rises to the level of a 60B6 claim. It's, it's truly extraordinary relief, and, and that's what the Supreme Court and the Fifth Circuit have, have said. Um, and and, and that those, those, you know, that, that's what I'm bound by. Um, you know, do I think there was an ongoing, you know, duty to disclose it to the court on early in October? I, I, I don't, I don't want to speculate about what people knew at that time and didn't know, and and whether people thought it made sense to talk about stuff at that time or, or didn't know. I, I don't know. I do know that people know now, um, and sounds like Mr. Coverson is is doing some deep digging, and and if you find something, I'll I'll be here. I'm just a, I'll be here. I do note for the record, um, all there have been no final fee applications approved, and all of that remains to a final. Everybody's rights, Mr. Coberson, all of your rights are preserved. You show up at a final hearing and say, "Judge, don't give them a buck, not a dollar for any of them." Um, that's your right. You're in a you're a party in interest, and you have the right to be to appear and be heard on that matter. Um, I don't see anything right now. Um, I think. Declarations being filed on the record have weight, and they'll they'll stand out there. Um, and so I know that they're taking those matters seriously, and I know that Latham and M3 know what it is to file declarations on the docket. Those are very serious matters. They're, they're signed under penalty of perjury, so they're, they're they're incredibly seriously, and they're not to be um, given light talk. So I'm I'm going to deny all relief requested um, with respect to. Um, M3 and, and Latham, and it's, it's without prejudice. Um, folks can come back if you find something, but, but you got to, but you, there, there's got to be something there. Um, and right now, um, you know, I think we, we went through and there was a lot of confusion about whether I got assigned and then, you know, they, they used it to get to Jones and 
I remind people, I was on the panel in January of 2023. I had a 50% chance of getting a case where uh, um, I would have been your judge, and they would have gotten a judge who had been on the panel for uh, about 45 days. Um, that, that's I, I got it. There's a lot of discussion out there in the media about, um, at least not media, articles. And I, and I, I, I read some of the stuff that you uh you were alluded to uh, from Professor Rappaport and, and others. Not the time or the place to, to discuss kind of my thoughts on them, but I, I have read them. And if you were here earlier today, I, I think I really, some decisions weigh on me really heavily. Uh, and and they're not easy, not an easy. Uh, and certainly, so I'm, I'm certainly not here to try to make anyone feel good or, or, or bad. It's just really calling the things as I see them, um, but but certainly nothing has risen to the level to disgorge fees, um, especially when they're subject to a final, uh, and nothing to avoid the retention applications uh, or undo the retention applications. I think the the under the strict requirements of 327 and 2014, um, and all of other requirements there. Um, and as as to Jackson Walker, I'm going to Mr. Culver, I'm going to grant you a little discovery. I got to go back and read what you asked for, but but I do think. There, there's a 327 issue, um, and that is, what did you know at the time that you filed the application? Um, did you know something and just fail to disclose it at the time of the application? Um, during the case, did you learn something and fail to disclose it? What did you do when you did find out stuff? You know, when did you ever come to the court? Um, are you, I, I got it, are you aware of any, you know, did you do anything back channel? Kind of stuff. I, I think I, I'm going to, and I don't want to rule on the 60v6 now because I, I need you, I'm going to give you an opportunity to to get some discovery. You can kind of come in and say, you know, I, I, don't, I don't want you, if I'm going to grant you a, some discovery, I think it would be improper for me to then rule on your 60v6. So you can go, you know, I'm going to let you rest on the docks, but um, I'm going to give you some discovery, but then I'm going to rule on your motion. I need to kind of figure out how much time you're going to have. And I think there, there's a question. I don't know the answer. Um, but I do think you, you, you get some discovery um, to kind of figure out what you know, and I'll, I'll let you. I, I think I think the process. I think that's a colorable claim. Stuff gets disclosed, and people are saying around this time this stuff is happening, and you're here, and you know it, and your retention application says a name on it. Uh, I think I think you get to ask questions, um, and what what I would ask is just an opportunity to kind of. Go back and take a look at the discovery um, and see, see what you got. I, I, I got it. You're not carpet bombing. You're, you're, you want targeted discovery, and I think you'd be entitled to it. I, I know, again, we'll, we'll have it, and maybe we need to have a status conference at some point and just kind of set up a, a date that works for everyone and kind of talk when it makes sense to have a hearing um, and kind of see where, where things go uh, at that time. I, I don't want to talk about the merits of, of it, but I do think you're entitled to some discovery there. Um, and then let's come back and have a, a full evidentiary hearing on that, and, and you'll have to, you'll have your opportunity to present your case. Mr. Coverson, and if at some point you, you find, you know, and you want to have a status conference or an aha moment, I, I think that the best thing to do is just to, you can call or email my case manager. If, if you're just asking procedural stuff, like, hey, can I just have a, I'd like a status conference, no question, email. If you're asking kind of status plus a little, you know, a little extra, then, then I would ask that you copy other other parties on, on the email as well. Um, but if you're just asking how do I, for example, how do I, how do I get an emergency hearing or, or something like that, I think, I think that's fair to just contact my case manager. Um, we, we answer emails late. We answer emails over the weekend. We, well, she does. I don't. Um, we'll take things up. I think I, I do note for the record it's, it's a little unrelated. Um, I've signed a number of 2004 exams related to parties here who aren't requesting it. I think I signed some more related for 2004 exams with some banks who are looking into Silex. I, I, I got it. This stuff isn't over, and people are looking into things. And if things come up, um, we'll, 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 we'll take them up, and we'll deal with them in the ordinary course based on, on law and evidence. So thank you very much for your time. Uh, for the folks who are dialing into the 3.30 matter, if you just give me five minutes, I'm just going to allow the courtroom to clear out, and then I'll come back on at 3, at 3.40. Thank you.